Hello, welcome to BEH 229 Family Therapy. Today we're going to be talking about evidence-based family therapy. Evidence-based therapy is becoming the really the practice for family counseling. Researchers and clinicians today are paying closer attention to reliability and validity as they use self-report and observational techniques tailored to family interaction. In addition, they are paying attention to the larger systems of social influence, peers, schools, community, and neighborhood influences. So mom and dad and your siblings have probably the most intense influence on you, but your teachers when you start going to school, your peers, your friends, the people in your neighborhood all play an influence. Research evidence is impacting the delivery of clinical services by many practitioners, leading to a strong focus on combining research and practice with full attention to both. The gap between clinical research and practice is a major challenge for family therapy training programs, so they proposed 10 practical ideas for integrating research interests into clinical training programs so students are research informed as they cultivate their clinical experience. And when we talk about clinical experience, we have to also remember that when you're in a room with somebody and you're having a conversation, it's not necessarily something that you can just apply from a textbook. If they are sharing information that is causing a lot of um, upset, you have a toolbox of information that you've learned through your school and you can apply those, but there's no black and white answers. There's a lot of shades of gray in behavioral health because humans are not black and white in terms of they either do the right thing or the wrong thing. A lot of people like to do the wrong thing, but they think it's for the right reasons. So that's why this is so important. So number one, share with students how research has contributed to the evolution of the faculty member's own clinical work and professional development. Number two, expose students to demonstrations of how supplemental non-clinical research findings that are relevant to the study of marriage and the family can be used to psychoeducate clients in therapy sessions. Number three, teach students how to locate, comprehend, and critically evaluate research findings. So for example, if you've been asked to summarize research uh, studies or write a research paper, this is why we're trying to help you figure out how to be a better researcher. Number four, demonstrate the power of research to confirm or debunk commonly held beliefs. And number five, advocate for the inclusion of multiple types of research evidence. Moving on to number six, clarify the distinction between efficacy and effectiveness in research and explore controversies surrounding empirically supported treatments. Outline historical and theoretical marriage and family therapy roots in evidence-based practice. Number eight, introduce progress research and, if feasible, incorporate instruments into the training that give therapists direct feedback. Number nine, emphasize the role of common factors as well as model specific mechanisms of change. Number 10, refine core research course content to promote research and practice integration. So as an instructor, you know, we are uh, responsible for making sure that we stay with the most updated information in a particular field. Researchers employ both qualitative and quantitative research methodologies to explore a variety of content area, areas. For example, marital problems, alcohol and drug abuse, physical and mental illness, as well as diverse family structures, be it single parent families, step families, racially blended families, and gay and lesbian families. Quantitative measures describe and assess hypotheses and outcomes, whereas qualitative research tends to be 
an initial exploration or in-depth analysis of a particular issue. Qualitative research is hypothesis generative, while quantitative research is likely to be hypothesis testing. So qualitative often comes first and they start to look at a question that then leads to them generating a hypothesis, which is our qualitative or our quantitative research. So qualitative is more about generation, quantity is more about testing. Rather than polarize the field into quantitative versus qualitative methodologies, researchers today increasingly are adopting the viewpoint that the two can coexist and meet the current need for greater methodological diversification. For example, Gottman's intervention research with couples combines quantitative and qualitative methods and intertwines research and practice. Qualitative research methods can extend, enrich, and complement quantitative methods. And here's a little picture on the right here that kind of summarizes the differences between quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative research emphasizes experimentation, large samples, whenever feasible, data collection, statistical analysis, objectivity, and verification. Qualitative research, on the other hand, is more consistent with postmodern, post-structural viewpoints. It tends to be exploratory and open-ended, directed more at discovery than at evaluating a set of hypotheses. It expands and enhances quantitative research techniques, delving into greater depth, considering cultural variations, and exploring interpersonal interaction. Well-designed qualitative research is rigorous and trustworthy, advancing the field of family therapy. Many clinicians have been slow in embracing clinical research and using its findings to inform their practices. Clinicians in general are likely to be more interested in data revealing clinical significance, say the extent to which a specifically previously dysfunctional family following treatment develops sufficient skills to become functional, rather than statistical significance, which is the group differences in improvement between families receiving treatment and those who receive no, different, no treatment. Family therapists increasingly are asked to justify the treatment they offer by providing valid and reliable scientific data about its cost and effectiveness. So when you say, I think this could work, you need to be able to experiment, you need to be able to identify the variables and basically look at how we can move forward in a more hypothesis testing way. This little cartoon on the right kind of gives us a interesting explanation. So this study says massage improves sleep compared to the control group. And then the other person said, that's awesome. How much longer did the massage group sleep? And the original person says 47 seconds per night. So, you know, is this clinically significant or statistically significant? And again, what you have to look at is the overall system that you're working with. An ongoing debate among family therapists regards the applicability of formal research-based procedures for assessing couple and family processes. All therapists make evaluations based on their previous experience with families. All engage in clinical assessments, likely using a combination of interviews and behavioral observations, or perhaps relying on structured test inventories or presenting clients with interactive tasks that are encouraged to complete together. Behaviorally oriented family therapists in particular value administering their own specific standardized tests to couples or families. Clearly, despite attempts to integrate quantitative and qualitative research, for some clinicians, the difference between the two is significant and incompatible with deeply held interests. Some therapists believe that formal testing prior to therapy, especially where the subsequent therapist is also the family evaluator, 
gets family therapy off on the wrong foot. By interacting in a more genuine way with families from the start, many believe they do not need to undo any artificial relationship created as a result of a formal test inquiry. Family assessment first provides guidance for what the clients need and how best to intervene and later an evaluation of clinical progress and therapeutic outcomes. This process challenges those who shun formal testing, contending that an overall impression of the family system may obscure differences in individual contributions to the problem, and thus both a systems, i.e. family, and psychological, i.e. individual assessment are needed. Typically designed in the form of a questionnaire, self-report measures are the most widely used method for assessing family relationships and processes. They elicit family members' attitudes, roles, values, self-perceptions, and satisfaction with the family relationships. Self-report measures can also be administered at various stages of family treatment measuring both change and the effectiveness of the previous interventions. A carefully researched and validated example of an insider or family's member's view of two central properties of family life, flexibility and cohesion, was developed by David Olson and his colleagues. Olson and associates created a family map that depicts 25 types of couple or family relationships. It is based on a family's degree of flexibility, i.e. its ability to permit changes in its role relationships, role leadership, and the emotional rules, as well as cohesion, which is the emotional bonding of family members to one another. Now if you look over here on the right hand side, you're going to see a variety of different axes, axes, and your ideas of what is balanced, mid-range, or extreme. Your y-axis is your adaptability, your x-axis is your cohesion, and disengaged, separated, connected, or enmeshed, and then along the y-axis for adaptability, chaotic, flexible, structured, and rigid. So depending on where you and your family fit in these various boxes that will identify what exactly is going on in the family and this is called the circumplex model. A third dimension communication involves the family skill level in listening to each other and facilitates or impedes family movement on two primary dimensions. Flexible family functioning balances stability and change cohesion requires a balance between enmeshment and disengagement. A family's placement on this grid is determined by its members response to a 42 item self-report research instrument called the Family Adapt Adap Adaptability and Cohesion Evaluation Scale. Each family member completes the test twice. The discrepancy between the two provides a measure of satisfaction. The greater the discrepancy, the less satisfaction. The Family Environment Scale, widely used in family research since its introduction by Rudolf Moos, attempts to assess the impact of the family environment on individual and family functioning. Moos began his research with the assumption that a social climate has characteristics that can be portrayed and thus measured accurately. For example, some are more supportive than others. Some people are more rigid, controlling, and autocratic. In others, order, clarity, and structure are given high priority. Moose argued that to a large extent the family environment regulates and directs the behavior of the people within it. The Family Environment Scale, now translated into at least 11 languages, has been proven to be a reliable and valid testing instrument. It is a valuable clinical research tool for evaluating key aspects of a family's functioning and has been used in more than 500 studies. So that's where we get our evidence-based piece from. 
The scale contains 90 statements to be labeled as true or false by each family member. For example, family members really help and support one another, or family members often keep their feelings to themselves, or we fight a lot in our family. Responders are asked to rate their families as they see them and then as how they would really ideally take their families as they see them and then how they would like their families to be. Observations in real time of interacting couples and families are especially appealing to those who prefer objective outsider measures of family functioning. Interactive coding schemes, which is again the diagramming family interactive patterns along a series of cognitive, affective, and interpersonal dimensions, we talked about this when we did genograms, or rating scales, judging and scoring those overt observable patterns along previously determined dimensions. The former are designed to capture the moment to moment contingencies of the behavior of family members towards one another, while the latter seek a more global objective summary judgment of family interdependent relationship patterns. One long-term empirically based research project focuses on those dimensions of family functioning ID identified by research as having the most impact on the emotional and physical well-being of family members. Number one, basic task area, how the family deals with problems of providing food, money, transportation, and shelter. Number two, developmental task area, how they deal with problems arising as a result of changes over time, such as first pregnancies or the last child leaving home. Hazardous task area, how they handle crises that arise as a result of illness, accident, loss of income, job change, and such. This model, which is called the McMaster model, includes a self-report instrument and the observational clinical rating scale with both probing family functioning in six crucial areas. Number one, family solving problem. Number two, family communication. Number three, family roles. Number four, effective responsiveness number five, affective involvement, and number six, behavior control. And here's an example of how you would kind of see the various ways of functioning on y-axis and family behavior on the x-axis. So, um, you know, down here where behavior control seems like it's a problem as you go, you know, along the behavioral axis. The FAD measures family functioning using 60 self-reported items, resulting in scores on each dimension as well as a general functioning scale. The clinical rating scale assesses these dimensions as the therapist rates them on a 7-point scale, from 1 meaning severely disturbed to 7 superior functioning. A rating lower than 4 suggests the need for therapeutic intervention. And if you look at the picture that I put on this slide, you're going to see that the McMaster model of family functioning is part of that psychodynamic, structural, and social constructivist uh, perspective. So we're looking at realism from a critical perspective. Moving on to the Beaver's Systems model, this well-established measurement instrument provides a means for ordering families along a progressive continuum with respect to their competence, how well they perform the necessary and nurturing tasks of organizing and managing themselves. Beaver's Interactional Competence Scale measures family functioning at a particular moment in the family's life. Thus, repeated measures chart family's progress, say after a specific period of therapy, by viewing functional and dysfunctional patterns as a continuum, the scale endorses the idea that growth and adaptation in families is possible. Families are rated along two axes, their interactive style and their degree of competent family functioning. Families 
with a centripetal style tend to be inner oriented and to view relationship satisfaction as emanating from within the family. Those in extreme centrifugal families are viewed as outwardly directed and more openly expressive of anger. Those family members tend to seek satisfaction from outside the family. Taken together, family style and family competence judgments provide a useful snapshot of current family functioning and offer a guide to how and how best to begin to intervene in improving family functioning. And the little picture at the bottom will show you that centrifugal is away from the center, centripetal is toward the center. In order to understand family dynamics, it is often helpful to assess couple relationships that contribute to family patterns and processes. The dyadic adjustment scale, or DAS, is a 32 item self-report assessment of dyadic satisfaction, cohesion, consensus, and affectional expression. A review of couple and family therapy outcomes studied found the DAS to be the most frequently used outcome measure by far. A, originally a measure of adjustment or quality, it has been interpreted as measuring couple satisfaction and correlates with other measures of satisfaction. It has been found to accurately assess male and female perspectives as well as demonstrate strong reliability across all cohabitating couples regardless of sexual orientation, ethnicity, and marital status. A systematic perspective includes an awareness of individual issues that interact with couple and family dynamics. The applicability of several individual standardized assessments for couple and family evaluation such as the MMPI-2, MCMI-3, the Rorschach inkblot test, and the Kinetic Family Drawing Test, combine them with interviews, observation, clinical records, and collateral information, providing input to couples and families. And over here on the right, you'll see a little cartoon, the Rorschach test through the decades, the 1960s, that you see a kind of a mushroom cloud, they see it as a bomb. Well, nowadays we see it as a tree because really until recently we haven't been worried about nuclear annihilation or mutually, um, mutually assured destruction until uh, we started getting all dysfunctional with the other countries in the world. Psychotherapy research investigates the therapeutic process, meaning the mechanisms of client change, to develop more effective methods of psychotherapy. There is considerable research evidence that couple and family therapy is effective for virtually every type of disorder and for various relational problems in children, adolescents, and adults. Process research identifies and operationally describes what actually takes place during the course of the therapy. Process research does not simply concern itself with what transpires within the session, but also without of session events occurring during the course of family therapy. Finally, the experiences, thoughts, and feelings of the participants are given as much credence as their observable actions. Thus, certain of the self-report methods we described earlier in this chapter may provide valuable input in the process analysis. Process research attempts to reveal how therapy works and what factors in therapist behaviors, patient behaviors, and their interactive behaviors are associated with improvement or deterioration. For example, a researcher might investigate a specific process variable concerning family interaction, who speaks first, who talks to whom, who interrupts whom, and so forth. Or perhaps the process researcher wants to find out what special ways of treating families with alcoholic members elicit willing family participation as opposed to those that lead to resistance or dropouts from treatment. Are there 
certain intervention techniques that work best at an early treatment stage and others that are more effective during either the middle stage or terminating stages of family therapy. Which means basically that feedback is essential. Immediate client feedback on the therapeutic process is an important form of clinically relevant research. Family therapists may conduct research on their own interventions by using computerized feedback systems to inform the process and prog progress of treatment. For most models discussed in this text, greater evidence for the specifications of change mechanisms is still needed to meet the research criteria for how best to tap into the therapeutic change process. Ultimately, all forms of psychotherapy must respond to this question. Is this procedure more efficient, more cost-effective, less dangerous, with more long-lasting results than other therapeutic procedures or versus no treatment at all? Effective research needs to provide evidence for what models work best for what specific problems and under what conditions. This is termed family intervention research and may be defined as a systemic approach to understanding the practices, their outcomes, and the varying, moderating, and mediating variables that may affect the success or failure of different clinical interventions. By linking process issues with outcome results, the family therapist would be proceeding using an empirically validated map. The Society for Family Psychology of the American Psychological Association convened a task force to develop a classification of evidence-based treatments in order to categorize family interventions with a commitment to clinically relevant outcomes. Major reviews of couple and family therapy interventions establish the efficacy and effectiveness of these treatments for a variety of treatment issues and client populations. Consistent with the strength of evidence model, researchers suggest that seven factors must be considered in rating couple and family therapies. Number one, intervention type. Two, clinical outcomes. Three, strength of research, four, client characteristics, five, common therapeutic processes, number six, context, number seven, quality. Evidence supporting family level interventions is strong for child and adolescent conduct or behavioral problems, especially when combined with parenting programs. Family-based treatments for substance abusing adolescents, adolescent bipolar disorder, and youth depression have received empirical support. The widely accepted definition of evidence-based practice is as follows. Evidence-based practice in psychology is the integration of the best available research with clinical expertise in the context of patient characteristics, culture, and patient values. So when we look at these various testing instruments and methodologies, what we're really looking for is what works the best in a particular situation. And that's where the evidence comes in that will help lead us in the right direction. Research evidence, quantitative and qualitative methodologies, clinical observations, single case studies, process, and outcome research. Clinical expertise, meaning therapist skill, judgment, and experience in assessment, case formulation, treatment planning, and techniques of intervention. And finally, patient characteristics. Personality, specific problem, cultural background, gender, sexual orientation, social and environmental context, and race. One difficulty in reconciling the views of practitioners and researchers is that they operate in different worlds, the former focused on service to clients, the latter on expanding understanding of clinical phenomenon or testing the effects of new procedures. Nevertheless, there is a growing acceptance of the place of evidence-based studies in clinical practice, 
and practitioners may experience increased pressure from the third-party payors and government agencies to base their interventions on established evidence-based treatments. Clinicians in the future will be held increasingly accountable for providing outcome assessments for their clinical interventions. Finally, the demand for accountability can be seen in medicine and education as well as in psychology, where professionals are being pressured to base their practices on evidence whenever feasible. So what they're saying is when you are using a particular technique, you must be able to prove that it in fact has evidence that it works. So for example, uh, many, many years ago, there was this idea that, you know, if children, adolescents who were really problematic went through a quote-unquote rebirthing process, that would help them work through their problems. And there was a um, therapist who used to put the adolescent in a bag and then basically jumble them around and they had to come out of the bag themselves, which again... Re, you know, it refers to the rebirthing process. Well, to be honest, it didn't work. It was kind of silly and kids got hurt. So today, society is much more focused on do we have evidence? Did we test it? Did we hypothesize, test, look at the res results, and then look to see what else we can do? For psychotherapy, there is an increasing momentum to establish an empirically validated basis for delivering healthcare services based on the assumption that clinical interventions backed up by research will make the effort more efficient, thereby improving the quality of healthcare and reducing healthcare costs. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to email or text your instructor. If you're not in this class, please leave a comment and we will return and uh, provide any answers that we can. Thank you so much and have a great day.